afternoon committee uh, meeting of House Appropriations, and we are continuing with our CRF funding. And we have with us Mike O'Grady, and we received, I believe, yesterday or the day before, um, the Senate proposal uh, for agri for ag for uh, expenditures in agriculture. So, Mike, do you have that, or does Teresa have for a highlight sheet? Uh. Thank you, Mike. And so welcome, uh, Mike. We're, oh, I've got to just get Marty in here. And, and here we are. So Mike, if you want to join us, you have the floor to do the quick walkthrough. And then we can see the differences between the House and Senate version. OK. Um, so generally, the Senate, well, step back. Framework for you is the House committee's proposal was to establish a grant program for milk producers and dairy processors. They had in that program a $50 million award to be reduced according to any um, percentage that, that you recommended. Uh, the Senate proposal uh, includes an assistance program for milk producers and dairy processors, but also includes an assistance program for other farmers, commercial processors, commercial slaughterhouses, and farmers markets. The Senate was working with a $30 million total number. So $19 million is appropriated for milk producers. 3.8 is appropriated for dairy processors and 7 million would be appropriated for the non-dairy sector, the other farmers and commercial processors, commercial slaughterhouses, et cetera. In addition, S-351 appropriates $192,000 to the VHCB for additional services that VHCB can provide post-COVID for business services, um, food and farm, services and mental health services, um, all of which have increased since, or the demand for which has increased since the COVID-19 public health emergency. Mike, so that's- Clarification there. Did you say VHCB is addressing mental health services? Yes, they um, are going, they hire contractors. Uh, they are experiencing, um, when farmers are, are seeking their assistance, they are identifying that, that those farmers are, are experiencing distress, other trauma, and they want to be able to um, provide uh, some necessary services to those farmers in addition to their um, business and other technical services that they provide. I'm not questioning the need for mental health services. I'm questioning why VHCB would be charged with that. That's what I was, that, that's just in, we can learn that as you walk through the bill, but. Sure, well, it's, it's really not much more detailed than, it's actually less detailed than what I just told you um, in the <laughs> bill. Uh, it's, it's really about them being on the farm um, and them interfacing with the farmer and wanting to be able to provide those resources um, when they think they're appropriate. And, and they're not providing them themselves, they would, right, would do it through a contractor. Okay. Um, so you could just start out with the, the first section. This would be the dairy assistance program. Uh, this bill was drafted well before the template came out that you're supposed to follow. So it does not follow the template. Uh, the key definition um, would be dairy processor on page two, um, as really those persons or businesses that, that produce dairy products. Economic harm, which is right below that, the milk producer dairy processors expenses or lost revenue are both related to COVID-19. Then you can go on to the next page and look at the definition of milk producer under subdivision nine the person partnership uh, corporation that owns or controls dairy cows, dairy goats, or dairy sheep, and sells uh, or offers for sale a part or all of their milk um, produced by the animals. 
Uh, then you get the program establishment at the bottom of that page to provide financial assistance to milk producers and dairy processors. You get the eligibility requirements. Uh, they must be currently producing milk or dairy products. They must be in good standing. And this is different from the House Committee's proposal. Um, good standing as defined in this bill means that they don't have an active enforcement a violation brought against them by the Agency of Agriculture or the Agency of Natural Resources. But since this bill was passed the Senate, a question has come up that's probably a broad application to all CRF grants. And it's Administrative Bulletin 5. And that has a good standing provision in it that says you can't be in default on your state taxes you can't be in default on your child support and the state can set off any money owed to you uh, under this program for any liability owed to the state so what you should be aware of is administrative bulletin five is going to reduce the number of people who are eligible under this program and probably under any other CRF program where an individual or a business is going to receive a direct award. Um, Are you saying that, Mike, that that language is going to be universal in all the CRF bills? Well, what I am saying is that Administrative Bulletin 5 applies to any state grant program. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's it's issued by the Secretary of Human Service Human Resources uh, okay. for for or a Secretary of Administration for every um, grant that a state agency issues, and there are mandatory terms and conditions. And one of those is you must be in good standing with the state on your taxes. You must be good standing on your child support, and you, any liability you owe the state may be set off in an award from the state. So what that's gonna mean is that, for instance, a farmer who hasn't been able to pay their state income tax is not gonna qualify for this program. We have, and oh, go ahead, I'm sorry, we have two questions when you're done. A restaurant that didn't play, pay its rooms, meals, alcohol tax may not qualify for a CRF program. So, so you need to realize that it, it really only came up um, when a farmer raised the issue with Senator Hardy after this bill was passed. And I said, well, yes, those are just the, the, the default terms and conditions of any state grant. And it follows logically because um, you, you don't normally wanna give money to people who are violating the law. Right, and that's that's a concept or a policy that runs throughout grant programs at the state level, at the federal level. But here, for taxes or a set off, um, the potential recipients they may not have had any ability to pay their taxes. This may not have been in an intentional withholding of taxes or intentional non-payment. They may have no income to pay whether it's a restaurant or a farm or other business, and do you want to disqualify them because they are not in good standing with their state taxes? Okay, we have a few questions. We have um, Mary, Chip, Bob, and Diane. I think you've clearly said this, but let me just make sure. So it's not that they can receive it and then have to use it to pay back whatever their obligation or their penalty is with the state. It is they may not get into the program period. Yes, that you have to certify that you're in good standing. And um, if you are not, you may not qualify. The granting agency um, has some discretion to waive that requirement, but it is it is supposed to be case by case. So you're kind of leaving a determination of eligibility based on this to whomever the grant entity granting entity would be. So it's it's uh, 
you know, normally this is such a default issue that it, that most people didn't even think of it, mm -hmm. but, um, because you, it's just good policy not to give money to people that are violating the law or owe the state taxes, but this may be a different policy decision for you as a body. So the yeah. governor said to people who had trust fund obligations, so rooms, meals, sales, tax, et cetera, you do not have to pay your taxes until I think Mar uh, uh, July 15th, maybe that was income. If they have not paid on that date, they would not be eligible for the grant programs that follow. Well, they, so here's, I'll read to you the, the taxes due to the state um, requirement. It says party understands and acknowledges responsibility if applicable for compliance with state tax laws, including income tax withholding for employees performing services within the state, payment of use tax on property used within the state, corporate and or personal income tax on income earned within the state. So that one's really, you're just acknowledging your responsibility. But then you have to say, party certified under, under the pains and penalties of perjury that as of the date of the agreement is signed, the party is in good standing with respect to or in full compliance with the plan to pay any and all taxes due to the state. Party understands a final payment may be withheld if the commissioner of taxes determined that the party is not in good standing with respect to or in full compliance with the plan to pay any and all taxes due to the state. So you have to certify under perjury that you're in good standing and if the Department of Taxes determines that you're not, they may withhold the award. Okay, Mary, are you finished? Uh, Chip and Bob and Diane. Diane, you're right now, okay. Well, I keep having more questions as, as Mike talks, but I'll just stick with this one for the moment. Um, so we all know that a corporation is a person. What? or and some businesses are set up as partnerships so if you're not a sole proprietor you are an llc or a partnership or something is the entire how, how will that be addressed if the entire business is not um, defaulted on some or is not in good standing i should say um, in some way but only one member what happens then well, it's it's going to be whoever the the corporate entity is that's applying, right? If if the corporate entity is in this case a, a farm, it'll be about how that farm is is registered with the agency of agriculture, um, and so that corporate entity needs to be in in good standing with the state on its taxes. Um, okay. Um... So in some other instance, let's say a, a restaurant, um, there's an LLC, um, as long as the LLC is in good standing, it doesn't matter if um, one of the owners is, uh, you know, in arrears on child support or something. Well, child support is a different, but, different okay, condition. Let, let me do something else, but you know, is, um, hasn't paid their own personal income tax or you know is in some way not in good standing right so it's about the party and the party is the applicant and okay. and and but for just to answer the child support question they make a distinction there for child support they say if the applicant is a natural person and not a corporation or partnership the party needs to state that they are in good standing with their child support so you see the distinction there. It's like, it's yeah. it's a if the party is going to be that business entity, they're going to use the business entities standing with the state, not the individual, you know, members or shareholders. I guess that makes sense. It's a little obvious now that you've said it. Thanks. Uh, we may have to come back and revisit this issue. Um, Bob and Marty, you have two quick questions because we have less than 15 minutes to finish walk, the walkthrough of the bill because we have the health care bill on the floor. So I am going to I'm going to stand down, okay, in the name of time. Okay, we'll Thank have you. to we're gonna have to come back to this. Uh, Marty. 
the same thing. I was going to talk about that particular issue, but we can talk about that later. Okay, we'll come back and um, let's go back to the bill and see. If okay. Out. Well, actually, from this point in the dairy processing program to the end of the dairy um, assistance program, it's the same as the house, except for the amounts. So if, if Teresa, you can go to page five at the bottom of the page, the Senate working with that $19 million for the dairy assistance for small farms for the milk producers, they came up with these maximum amounts for the different categories of farms. And then if you go on to the next page, you'll see that for dairy processors working with a $3.8 million appropriation for all dairy processors, they came up with those maximum amounts for the different tiers of dairy processors. So. This is a key difference between the, the House Committee's proposal and the Senate proposal because the Senate was working off of that 19 million slash 3.8 million dollar breakdown for the different producers and processors, and the um, House Committee was working off of that 50 million dollar um, administration proposal and the amounts underneath that proposal. So moving on from there, most of the rest of this information is basically about administration of the program, including applications and um, some of the default terms, compliance with the CARES Act, et cetera. Uh, I'm gonna take you therefore to the next program, um, which is gonna be section three on page 10. Um, on section three, you'll see the agricultural producer or processor assistance program. And so one of the things that the Senate Committee on Agriculture looked at, they looked at what percentage of farming slash agricultural industry is dairy and what percentage is non-dairy. And they heard from the Agency of Agriculture that dairy is about 70% of the agriculture industry and everything else is about 30%. So using their breakdown or their appropriation of 30 million, they set aside 7 million for an agricultural producer or processor assistance program for that other 30%. And so the first definition that's important is agricultural producer at the bottom of page 10. It's a farmer who's not eligible underneath section one. So a farmer that's not eligible as a milk producer or as a dairy processor. Um, and then you'll see that um, who also is eligible are commercial processors. And those are people who process meat products in the state, commercial slaughterhouses, those who are engaged in the business of slaughtering. And then on page uh, 12, farmers markets are also the ones are also eligible under this program and it's not um, the each individual stall in the farmers market it's the farmers market entity the, the those who are um, registered uh, and defined under 11 VSA section 991 um, and so those who are eligible under this program an important difference in this program from the milk producer and dairy processor is that on page 13, line 11 through 13, these businesses cannot have had a net profit between March 1, 2020 and August 1, 2020. There was some concern that some of these businesses have actually been doing very well during this time frame, because of the demand for, or the increased demand for more local food or the increased demand for more slaughtering because slaughter uh, in other states has shut down. And so the, the Senate didn't want to award businesses that are doing well just because they had a cost or expense that was related to COVID-19. So if they've had a net profit in that period, they don't qualify underneath this program. Um, then you get to the maximum awards on page 14. 
Um, they based these awards on annual gross sales. Um, and so they looked at a USDA census document to determine these breakdowns of what is small, what is medium, et cetera. And then using the $7 million, uh, they backed into these numbers um, using Nolan at JFO and playing with some um, assumptions about how many farms are in each class. Uh, and USDA census information provided a general estimate of how many farms are in each class. Um, and so then the rest of this is again, that administration and application of the program, um, not a, a significant difference from the milk producer and dairy processor assistance program that you can go to page 17. Um, uh, one thing I should have noted for both the milk producer dairy processor program and this program, you'll see it on the bottom of page 17 going on to 18, that any funds that aren't appropriated um, expended by November 1st shall revert to the agency for reallocation under either the dairy processor assistance program or underneath this agricultural producer. So if you haven't, if you've appropriated money, it's been granted, but it hasn't been expended. That needs to go back to, to the agency for reallocation. Uh, the agency wants to make sure that this money is going out and being spent um, as soon as possible. Um, moving on from there, uh, there needs to be education and outreach in section five regarding these programs and the availability of the financial assistance. Um, and then there is a report on page 18, line 17 through 21. Um, so the Senate wanted the report monthly. They're a little concerned that the agency may focus more on the milk producer and dairy processor assistance program than the, than the other program, the agriculture producer program. And because of that reversion language I just walked you through, they want to make sure that the agency is implementing the agricultural producer assistance program diligently so that they don't just take that $7 million on um, October 1st and, and reallocate it. Uh, they want to make sure both programs are being implemented appropriately and therefore they're asking for a monthly report. Um, section six, uh, there was some testimony about uh, informing farm workers of the risk of uh, the public health risks of COVID-19. Apparently, VOSHA has developed information about that. Section six requires the Agency of Agriculture to produce that information, the VOSHA information on the agency's website and to post it in English and Spanish. Section seven is that appropriation to VHCB that I discussed at the beginning of the meeting, 192,000 from the CRF for business financial and mental health assistance to farm and food businesses that suffered losses due to COVID-19. Um, and then section eight, this amends VHCB's general overall corporate authority to clarify that they have the powers of a nonprofit corporation. They have been applying for funds that are, or grants that are only available to nonprofits and they've been receiving some resistance as to whether or not they are a nonprofit. They would like it to be clear in their authority that they are a nonprofit. This will allow them to access um, more funds um, for their programs. And then on page 21, line eight through 21, uh, this just kind of uh, formalizes some corporate authority that BATB is likely already exercising. Um, for example, making publishing rules and regulations with regard to its housing programs, uh, making it legal documents necessary for um, exercise of its powers. They just want that authority set forth clearly in statute 
it's likely um, authority they're already exercising. Uh, and that really takes you to the page five, page 24, section nine. Um, a few years ago, you uh, created something called the Rural Economic Development Initiative. Um, it was effectively an appropriation to VHCB for a staff person to um, work with municipalities and, and who do not have grant writing ability um, and to help those municipalities and similar entities access grants um, that they otherwise wouldn't have the capacity to um, navigate. So that program with a $75,000 appropriation has been drawing down, I think it's drawn down over $4 million to date for municipalities uh, in its three years of existence. Um, so the Senate would like to repeal the proposed sunset of the program and just to make it a permanent program um, because it has been um, very successful considering the amount that's being put into it. And everything takes effect on passage. I'm muted, I'm sorry, I was muted. Thank you, Mike. We have a few minutes, three minutes before we go to the floor and I know we're going to have more questions than are in three minutes and we may need to have you back, Mike. I don't know your schedule tomorrow. Um, just so that Mike um, has some things that he can come back and talk to us about and we can and expedite our questioning. Are there topics that we would like Mike to be able to come back and explain to us? We do know that there were uh, questions regarding the big standing on taxes language. So that is, that's a piece, Mike, that we will continue with. Are there other questions that he needs to be prepared um, that wouldn't go to CHIP and wouldn't go to the work group, but that we need ledge council to talk about. Mary? The, I, I don't know who gets it, but I would be curious to know how many entities will be affected by these provisions and how much um, in grants are they likely to see? My, my guess is somebody did a kind of a back of the envelope analysis. No, actually, uh, JFO Nolan did a pretty detailed analysis. I've okay. got a Google spreadsheet that I can send you. Um, the, the milk producer and dairy processor program is designed so that all of those processors and producers will get it, will, are intended to get a grant. Whereas the agricultural producer and processor program, there's likely more of those entities basically the money's going to run out of that prep program. Um, so there may be people that don't receive a, an award. It's going to be a first come first serve program. Okay. I'd love to see the spreadsheet sure. and if it shows the grant amounts, that would be terrific. Yeah. He's, he's got it all broken yeah. down. I'll, I'll send it to um, Teresa right now. Thank you, Mike. Are there other questions that you have that you would like Mike to be prepared for um, when he comes back? Chip is going to start conversations with um, House Ag and Senate Ag this afternoon. So make sure if you have thoughts on directions you believe this should go that you uh, get your thoughts to Chip today. Is that they will talk today and I'm sure tomorrow I doubt they'll have a, a proposal for us by the end of the day. They seem to be um, a bit far apart. Okay, we need to go to the House floor. Mike, thank you. And Teresa, um, I've got to add, yeah, I, we need you back in for another, I would say half hour, Mike, tomorrow, if you have time. Okay, well, I'm also drafting a forest uh, economy stabilization grant program. I, yes. will, I have language for that already. Um, it doesn't have all the the default language, all the necessary expenditure, attorney general, all that language in it, but um, it has the base of the program in it. And should I send it to the department and have the... And you went out, Mike, should you send it to the department and... 
you froze, Mike, just when we needed to hear that. <laughs> um, I think a Chip has asked you to um, review, uh, to do that language. Chip, is that the language that, that you were talking to us earlier about today? Yeah. So you were going to send it to the Department of what, Agriculture? I, I will send it to the Department of Forests and Parks and I'll send it to Representative Conquest and then you can let me know if you want me to walk through it tomorrow. Thank you, okay. Teresa, I'm gonna jump I, off, I might tomorrow. need to be on the floor. Yep, we all need to go to the floor and Teresa, you'll do that schedule and I'll see everybody tomorrow at 8.30 and we have another bill, school construction uh, that we need to put on our list of to, to get done. All right, uh, thank you. Thank you.